Hello everybody, Shrouded Hand here. Today's video was suggested by a viewer who grew up in the same area where these events took place. They were 10 years old when it happened and so they grew up hearing lots of information that didn't make it into the news. They were able to help me out with locations and extra details about this case but they've asked to remain anonymous. So thanks a lot to that anonymous person for all your help with this video. This is the case of the Broomhead Scythe murder. <laughs> 17 year old Terry Hurst had grown up in foster care. He lived in the Shire Green area of Sheffield, England before moving to the nearby market town of Peniston. He was a student at Sheffield College. He loved skateboarding, the outdoors and going camping. He was a member of the Boys Brigade which is a Christian youth organisation similar to the Boy Scouts. He seems to have been an all round decent guy, known locally as a good Samaritan who would help anyone out. The only thing holding him back was a fairly serious learning difficulty. It meant that he had a speech impediment and the mental ability of someone of around 14 years of age. This made him somewhat naive and a little too trusting of others. It also made him a prime target for bullies. John Sorden and Rebecca Peters had gone to high school with Terry. These two were known troublemakers. By the age of 17, John Sorden had a number of convictions for petty crimes. Rebecca Peters was a couple of years younger. She was drinking heavily and becoming increasingly violent and unruly when she was drunk. Jermaine James hadn't gone to the same high school, but he was regularly hanging out with John and Rebecca in a loose group of friends. This was a boy whose behaviour was so disruptive that he'd been thrown out of his family home at the age of 16. Exactly how friendly they were with Terry Hurst is hard to say. He wasn't a part of their friend group. There was a rumour that there was some sort of tension between John Sorden and Terry Hurst. Terry had previously dated a girl that John was now going out with and for some reason this made John very angry. Sorden regularly made comments to his friends about how he would like to kill Terry. Similar remarks were made by Rebecca Peters. A high school friend recalls how she once pointed to Terry and said, Have you seen his hair? It's scraggy, isn't it? I'm going to end up killing him someday. These might have just been offhand comments. Their full significance was only known after that one night in July 2004 when John, Rebecca and Jermaine invited Terry Hurst to go on a camping expedition with them. Although Terry didn't know them well, he loved any opportunity to get out into the great outdoors and he saw this as a way to get in with their friend group so he eagerly agreed. Later that day the four of them set out from the village of Bolsterstone and they walked about a mile into the wooded area next to the Broomhead Reservoir. Here in the dark woods, far away from any civilization, they set up their camp. Precisely what happened that evening has never really been established. They might have had an argument, because at some point later that evening the three walked back to Bolsterstone village, leaving Terry Hurst alone in his tent. Back in the village they went to John Sorden's house, they picked up some alcohol and the three started drinking. At some point, the trio decided to head back to the campsite. 
Now quite drunk and possibly under the influence of other substances, they took a short detour into the graveyard of St. Mary's Church. In the graveyard, they stole two agricultural scythes from a storage shed. How much of this was premeditated is unknown. Perhaps they planned to take the scythes all along, or maybe they noticed the unlocked shed as they were passing and took the opportunity. Either way, they were now in possession of two extremely sharp, heavy weapons, and Terry Hurst's night was about to turn into a living nightmare. Back at the campsite, they found Terry asleep in his tent, wearing only socks and boxer shorts. What a shock it must have been for him as they dragged him out of the tent by his ankles and immediately set upon him with a flurry of stamps and kicks. What followed was a series of vicious assaults so brutal that detectives described the injuries as the worst they had ever seen. Many details of the attack were withheld from the public, but we have some descriptions from the court proceedings and eyewitness accounts of the state of Terry's body that help us build up a picture of what happened that night. They attacked him in three stages. After subjecting him to a brutal assault, they would let him run away so that he thought that his ordeal was over. Then they would chase him down and begin the torture all over again. He was beaten so badly that he had multiple bone fractures in various places on his body. His jaw was shattered and hung open limply. A tooth was knocked out and was found lodged in his esophagus. At some point they put a plastic bag over his head and stamped on his face. Then of course, there's what they did with the scythes. If you've ever seen someone use a scythe, you'll know it's a pretty unwieldy device. It requires two hands and it's swung in a wide arc. As a murder weapon, I can't imagine it would be too effective. Far too slow and inaccurate for a quick kill. What it would do though, is inflict a series of horrific injuries to his body over a prolonged period of time. His body had over 80 injuries. At least 40 of those were slash and stab wounds. There was a large gouge down his back and his hands hung in tatters from where he tried to defend himself from the scythe blows. We don't know how long there was between the first attack and Terry's final breath, but we do know that he suffered a slow, prolonged death. The final blow was the one that actually killed him. By that point in the evening they had probably had enough practice with the weapons to become quite adept at swinging them. The largest scythe was swung with such force that it was embedded deep inside Terry's skull. A farmer found his body the next day, dumped in a ditch next to Broomhead Reservoir. The scythe was still embedded in his skull. I'm going to read a bit here from the message that was sent to me by the viewer that suggested this story. I think it gives a unique perspective on the situation. They wrote, For me it really hits home, as a relative of mine lived next door to Rebecca Peters. At the time I was actually living with this relative, aged 10, and often played with Rebecca in the field over the back wall of their garden. If I remember correctly, I was out playing with her the day before the murder took place. I remember getting home from school one day and the street being flooded with police cars and a swarm of police engulfing Rebecca's house. I asked what had happened and they explained that I wouldn't be seeing Rebecca again. It was only a few years later that my relatives spoke to me about her horrific crime in detail. They say that they remember the three turning up at Rebecca's house the morning after the attack and joking whilst all eating bacon sandwiches cooked by Rebecca's mum. Rebecca had walked home in Terry's shoes after murdering him. As far as my memories go of Rebecca, it's kind of hard to explain. She was really nice and never acted maliciously towards me. That's probably why it's so hard for me to understand. 
I do remember her sneaking away for a smoke with some older lads, but I'm unsure if that was those two that committed the murder with her. It didn't take long after the discovery of Terry's body for the murder to be linked back to the three teenagers. They were tried in Sheffield Crown Court the following year. During sentencing, the judge said, Your offence was chilling. You knew he would be defenceless. You found him in a tent and set about him mercilessly. After the initial assault, Terry Hurst tried in vain to run. He couldn't escape. You all chased him and caught him and continued the attack. You intended to kill him. It was the cruelest of crimes and perhaps the more terrible because teenagers committed it. None of you showed any mercy whatsoever. Newspapers from the time reported that the teenagers got life, although if you've watched this channel for any length of time you'll know that life doesn't really mean much in the UK justice system. John Sordon appears to have been the ringleader and he would be considered for parole after a minimum of 15 years. Jermaine James and Rebecca Peters got a minimum of 13 years. As they were sentenced in 2005, I assume the parole hearings for each of them has been heard by now, but it's hard to find any follow-up information on whether they're still behind bars or not. The most I could find was an article about how Rebecca Peters has changed whilst in jail and was being considered for early parole. The article states, her early days in custody were troubled, but the judge said her growing maturity had heralded a marked improvement in her behaviour and she had qualified as a beauty specialist in prison. Reducing her minimum jail term by 10 months, Mr Justice Henrique said, I compare the unruly teenager who appeared to be substantially beyond control prior to the offence, in committing the offence and during her first three years in custody, and the mature, modestly ambitious, remorseful 22-year-old now at Low Newton Prison. If she is released in 2016, she will remain on life licence and will be recalled to prison if she puts a foot wrong ever again. So whether or not she was granted parole, I can't find any information on it or on the status of Jermaine James and John Sordon. It's possible that there's some sort of press gag order to protect their identities. In fact, that original article about Rebecca Peters' early release was deleted from the newspaper's website. I had to use archive.org to find it. The three of them might still be in prison. Some of them might be out. They might all be out. By the sounds of it, Peters had a good chance of being released in 2016, but if that has happened, the newspapers aren't reporting on it. As for the legacy of the murder itself, it's one of those small town crimes that's easily forgotten except by the people who lived through it. I've got to admit I'd never heard of this case before this week. There's a song by Bring Me The Horizon called Don't Go, where the lyrics seem to directly reference the murder of Terry Hurst. I tried looking into it and there's a lot of people online saying that the lead singer Ollie Sykes was John Sordon's cousin, but I don't know if that's just a rumour or not. It seems to be a matter of debate online. There's also a 2016 movie called Cruel Summer the plot of which is about a young autistic boy who goes camping and is attacked by three teenagers who violently torture and abuse him. According to IMDB, the director and filmmaker Philip Escott has stated in an interview that the film was merely inspired by youth culture within the UK rather than one specific incident, but its similarity to the Broomhead Scythe murder is a bit too close to be a coincidence. So that's pretty much all the information I can find on this case. If I find out any more information on the status of Jermaine, John or Rebecca, I'll put that in the description. For now though, I'm just going to say thank you once again to the anonymous viewer who brought this story to my attention. And a shout out to Sarah who apparently missed the old intro, so I thought I'd bring it back for this video. Let me know what you think in the comments, and if you're new to the channel then please consider subscribing. Huge thanks to everyone supporting the channel on Patreon and Paypal. 
Your help, as always, is highly appreciated and helps keep the channel going. Here's some more videos you might find interesting, so give them a click if you want. Until next time, goodbye.